stars, one and all. He knows how much sand is on the shores. He sees every sparrow that falls. He made the mountains and the seas. He's in control of everything, of all creatures, great and small. He knows my name, every step that I take. Every move that I make, every tear that I cry, He knows my name when I'm overwhelmed by the pain. Can't see the light of day, I know I'll be just fine, cause He knows my name. don't know what tomorrow will bring I can't tell you what's in store I don't know a lot of things I don't have all the answers to the questions of life but I know in whom I have believed he knows my name every step that Every move that I make, every tear that I cry, He knows my name when I'm overwhelmed by the pain. I can't see the light of day, I know I'll be just fine, cause He knows my name. step that I take, every move that I make, every tear that I cry. He knows my name when I'm overwhelmed by the pain. I can't see the light of day. I know I'll be just fine, cause He knows my name. Every step that I take, Every move that I make, every tear that I cry, He knows my name. The Lord for that. I'm grateful that He knows His children. Talked a little bit about that in Sunday school this morning. And if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, I can tell you this this morning, there's no other God like Him. Uh, there's no Savior that uh, besides Him. And I'm so thankful that He does know his children. Matthew chapter number 27 this morning. Once you find your place, I'd like to invite you, encourage you to stand if you're able uh, for the reading of the scriptures today. I'm so glad to be in church. So glad to see you here this morning. And uh, received some visitors this morning, home folk. Great to see you as well. Just thanks for being at church today and minding the Lord. We're going to read the first 10 verses of Matthew chapter number 27. Um, I had a couple different directions that I, I was thinking about maybe going this morning, uh, and I just kind of landed here and kind of tied together, really. And uh, so if you would, I trust the Lord would, would help us in the service today. Uh, I often say this, uh, but you may, if you're new, you may not have heard me say this. I hope that you'll listen on purpose this morning. I really hope that you'll try to make uh, everything in your mind uh, of yesterday, uh, this afternoon, tomorrow, and all those things, kind of put them to the side for just a minute, and let's listen on purpose and ask the Lord to give us something from Scripture this morning. The Bible said, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. The chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because of the price of blood. And they took counsel and brought with them the potters and bought with them the potter's field 
to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet saying, uh, which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying, and they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. Let's bow together this morning for a word of prayer. And uh, I'm going to ask Brother Jason if he would lead us as we pray this morning. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we use the word, oftentimes we use the word sorry. Or we'll use the phrase, you know, I'm sorry. Or, uh, or something of that, uh, along that line. And uh, it's probably, it's probably a, a very much overused word. Uh, and oftentimes it's probably a word that we give little thought to when we do use it. Uh, you know, you think about, you make, you make kids say, I'm sorry. Tell your brother you're sorry. Well, she's just gave him a black eye. She's not sorry. Okay, tell him I'm sorry. They're over there crying and sniffling. Sorry. Uh, that's about as heartfelt as, well, it's not very heartfelt. And uh, so we use that terminology. We use the I'm sorry. And oftentimes we use it to feel better about ourselves and to get ourselves out of trouble. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <clears throat> but the problem is that sometimes sorry just doesn't cut it. Sometimes sorry is not enough. And I, I look here, the Bible says here that <clears throat> Judas repented himself. Now, I think it, it bears, uh, it, it bears uh, telling or it bears, bears saying that when you use the word repented, you've got to use it together in this context with repented himself. Uh, it's not the same usage as when uh, Jesus said, or when Paul said over there in the, in the book of Acts, how that uh, we had repented and, and got saved. How, when he's referring to a person repenting and getting saved, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It's used differently. Okay, it's used differently. In the book of first, uh, Second Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 9, it's used differently than that uh, meaning of repentance. You know, for God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's used just a little bit differently when you see he repented himself. Uh, what that means is he literally regretted within, felt bad about it, but that's as far as the, his repentance took him. In other words, it got him to where he felt bad a little bit about what he had done, but not bad enough to handle it the right way. And I'm afraid too many times today it's so easy to say, well, I'm sorry. And it's so easy to feel bad and have regret, but not really do anything about it. A lot, of, a lot of folk today that are religious, they felt bad about it. Yeah, I'm a, they'll kind of flippantly say, yeah, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. I'm going to tell you something, that's not a genuine repentance toward God. That's a feeling bad about it. Well, I'm, you know, I regret doing it. Yeah, probably, you, you've heard people half-heartedly regret stuff. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that. What that means is, I'd do it again, but yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that. Well, I got to thinking a little bit about, about this thing of regret. Because I say this morning that regret alone is not enough. There's a lot of people that feel guilty. Okay? And many will even admit that they've sinned. One can even feel bad about their actions. But if that's as far as it takes them and they don't do anything to make restitution, then their regret was really good for nothing. Let me give you this. I got to thinking about this. You know, a, a drunkard may wake up the next morning and regret their actions. Their head's hanging over a toilet somewhere, or their face down in a ditch somewhere. They may regret the night before. They may regret how they acted. But man, you made a fool out of yourself. Man, I hate that. They may regret what they put their family through. They may regret the hurt that they even... I'm talking about a genuine regret. Don't misunderstand me. They may regret the people that they've hurt and the pain in which they've caused. They may regret the trouble that they're in, but so oftentimes they don't regret it enough to keep them from the bottle the next time. They don't regret it enough that the next time the temptation comes, the next time a trial comes, they don't regret it enough to say, well, I put my loved one through this, but you know what? I think I'm going to do it again. Regret alone isn't enough for restitution. I want to preach on this thought this morning. Sorry doesn't cut it. Sorry doesn't cut it. Religion says, be sorry. Salvation says, repent and turn to God. Amen. Sorry this morning just doesn't cut it. I don't know of anyone necessarily personally that would claim or profess to be religious who would be boastful 
in their sinfulness. But yet many have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're dependent on themselves. Let me give you three things to consider since sorry isn't enough. First of all, I think we need to consider the severity of our sin. Just how serious is the offense in which we've committed? You see, I'm afraid sometimes when we tell our children, say I'm sorry, they say they're sorry because they know they're supposed to say I'm sorry, but they don't really think it was that big a deal. I don't think it was a big deal that I took my brother's toy and hit him in the mouth with it. He had it coming. If you've got more than one child, you'll appreciate that concept. They had it coming. I'm not really sorry that I told the lie because I got out of trouble as long as nobody finds out. I'm not really sorry that I cheated on my test because I passed and nobody was none the wiser. You say, what is that? That's not a genuine repentance. I know I shouldn't have done it. But they don't really see the severity of their actions. I'm afraid to know that there's people that seated in churches all across this country and literally all across the world that understand that they're sinners but they do not appreciate fully the severity of their sin and what that sin means. Now when you look at this man Judas, we would say, man... What a sin. But yet we'll excuse ours. We'll justify our condition and we'll point fingers at others. So the Bible teaches in Romans chapter 7, verse number 13, that the law was given for a purpose. It was not just given as a list of do's and don'ts. The Bible tells us another portion of the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Why? That sin, listen to me, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding Sinful. It was meant to show us our need of a Savior. It was meant so that when we compare ourselves with Him, when we look at the law, which by the way, we're not going to be able to keep that, and it's not going to save you if you could. That wasn't the purpose. It was to point men and show men that the sin of our very heart, the sin of the very uh, essence of who we are, is exceedingly, or it is to be, exceeding sinful. In other words, it's not just a little something that we sweep under the rug. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Listen to me this morning. Sin today is still a big deal. Hey, the sin that goes against that goes against the pages of the Word of God is a big deal. I can start picking them out and I can start naming them. You know, it'd be funny if we it wouldn't be funny, but it'd be ironic uh, how many amens we got till it got down to, to our sin. Man, I can start preaching against the, whole, the, the, the sin of homosexuality. Uh, I, I can start preaching about the sin of abortion. I can go all the way down the list and we'd probably sit and say amen. But when I started talking about the sin of pride, when I started talking about the sin of arrogance, well, when I started talking about the sin of hypocrisy, it may get quiet before it got shouting and swinging off the chandeliers. You see, sin is severe. Listen, whatever your sin might be, but I'm not just talking about the action of sin. I'm talking about the very essence of sin in that we are sinners. We're sinners. We don't like to admit it. And our sin is severe and the severity of our sin carries consequences. Now we'll see that in just a minute. But that sin might become exceeding sinful. I feel like today's atmosphere, sin has been embraced. We've embraced it. We've, We've encouraged it. Our world system has done something that it's magnified it to be. This is the goal of what successful living really looks like. If you're not happy with your spouse, change. If you're not happy that you're having a child, do something about it. If you would rather be with someone of the same sex and pervert what God has called holy, have your your way and everybody else is supposed to accept it. And we're going to silence anyone who doesn't accept it. Now, that's where we're at today. You say, preacher, I don't, I don't agree with that. And obviously, I wouldn't think you did either. But not only are we in a society to where sin has been embraced, I think on a more personal note, I can see that oftentimes sin may not be embraced, but we do seek to make it excused. We do seek to pass over it in our life and say, well, you know, the Lord's still working on me. What that means is, is their sin's awful, but you know, God has patience with me. No, that sin might become exceeding sinful. Might become exceeding sinful. Now we look at Judas and we say, man, Judas was wicked. And truly Judas was wicked. But the sin of Judas does not outweigh our sin and our sin condition. And so let's look at some things. Instead of saying, I'm not so bad, or I haven't really done anything that bad, or I'm not as bad as him, and stop excusing our condition, 
And let's examine where we might be. How does everybody remember Judas? He's the one who betrayed Jesus. Can you imagine being the other disciple? Oh, Judas. Oh, no, no, that's not me. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Don't get me mixed up with him. Now, that's how everybody knows Judas Iscariot. He's the one that betrayed Christ. I didn't say denied him. I said betrayed him. But if we're looking at a few things regarding Judas' betrayal of Christ, I believe we can see the severity of his actions. All right, now, let's look at it. Because if we were to examine our own selves with the same scrutiny, I believe we'd find ourselves in much greater need than what we want to admit that we have. We'd see the severity of our own sin. Look at his motive of betrayal. Go back to chapter 26. I'm just going to give you a few of these quickly, and we're going to move right on to the next point. The motive of his betrayal. What motivated you? I mean, what would make a man turn against his Savior? What would make a man turn against the one uh, who stilled the storms and the one who had healed the sick and raised the dead, casted out devils, uh, would cause the lame to walk and the blind to see and the dumb to speak and the deaf to hear? What would make one turn against him? The one who changed the water into wine at, at, the, at the wedding of Cana of Galilee, uh, the one who did the miracles of the five loaves uh, and, the, and the, uh, the fishes in the loaf, the one who had done all of those things, the one who had walked on water, what would make a man betray him? What was his motive? Well, let's look at a couple of things. I believe pride of heart was the root of these, by the way. We learned from Sunday school this morning that pride, man, it played a big deal in the disciples' lives just like it does ours. You know, possibly it could have been that he was angry. Remember back in Matthew 26, the Bible tells us in verse 6 through 9, something about uh, what was going on there. The Bible said, Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment. And poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, To what purpose is this waste? You've wasted that on Jesus. Can you imagine? You've wasted. You're, you're wasting your life. You're wasting your substance on Jesus. For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said to them, Why trouble you the woman? She hath wrought a good work upon me. For you have the poor always with you, but... Me you have not always, for in that she hath poured the ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Therefore, uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached, in the whole world thou shalt also this that the woman hath done be told, her for more, uh, be told for a memorial of her. Jesus rebuked them. Jesus rebuked them. You know, if we're not careful, when the Word of God rebukes us for our condition, if we're not careful, it can stir up anger in our life. And rather than dealing with the sin, we'll begin to push it out and we'll begin to get angry and cause us to stir some things up. That's why people don't like to hear about the sin. That's why when you, you start preaching the truth and you start speaking the truth, listen to me, and standing for the truth. You know, I know people say oftentimes, well, I, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a missionary, and that's fine, well, and good, but a Christian ought to stand. And make a difference. And if when you stand for something, I'm not saying ugly and hateful and mean-spirited, but when you take a stand and say, I'm not going to move from this area in my life, you, well, that, that doesn't make me feel good. It's not about making the world feel good. It's about standing on that which is true. But we don't like to be rebuked. Possible it was anger. I believe it goes on a little bit further than that. I believe it ties together. I believe he was self-indulgent. I believe he was consumed with himself. When he went down and talked with the chief priest and the and the, uh, and the elders, down in verse number 15, or verse number 14, then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests and said unto them, look at it, what will you give me and I will deliver him unto you? What's it worth to you? He said, I'll sell out who I am if I can get something in return. What makes us, what makes us turn our eye to our, to our, to our sin or, or to our condition. What makes our sin so exceedingly sinful? I believe it's this. I believe we're not careful. We're all consumed with what we can get out of it. 30 pieces of silver. He betrayed the, the Lamb of God. 30 pieces of silver for a little bit of money, for a little bit of self-benefit, for a little bit of self-pleasure. He sold it all, traded it all in. What about not only his motive of betrayal, what about his mission of betrayal? Verse number 16, he tells us he began to look for an opportunity to betray. Can you imagine being so wrapped up in trying to carry out the task that you begin to look for a good opportunity when you can sell out your Savior? So preacher, that's wicked. I'm not that way. Yet opportunity after opportunity to live for Him passes by our way. Opportunity after opportunity that we have to stand for Him and to walk with Him and to fellowship with Him 
Those opportunities we just flippantly allow to slip away. Looks pretty similar. Begin to look for opportunity, not to walk with Him, but to betray Him. To betray Him. Begin to see how I can carry out this task. I believe it was appeared to be somebody who becomes so fixated on the task of their sin. That's all. It was, I have to do this. I have to get it done. That controlled and consumed the mind of Judas. When is a good opportunity? What is it that we're really fixated upon? What is it that we're really living for or, or pushing toward? Then the method of his betrayal. Y'all know what this is. You know what he did? He betrayed him with a kiss later on in chapter number 26. He betrayed him with a kiss. And I got to thinking about this concept. You know, that may have looked perfectly normal on the outside to everybody else. It probably been probably something that he had greeted Jesus with many times in the course of their three, three and a half years of walking on this earth together. He probably knew what it was like as he walked up and it, I mean, that was a cultural thing. He wasn't any kind of any kind of perversion or anything like we have in our society today. But many times he'd probably walked up and just greeted Jesus and and with, with a, you know, a brotherly kiss. And many times, he, and probably those around him may not even thought twice about it. You see, he made sure everything looked right on the outside, but he was corrupt as the day is long on the inside. Listen, we need to stop focusing so much on the outside, start taking care of on the inside. I, I believe this, if we can get our inside right, our outside will follow. Our outside. Now, I know that, listen, I'm, I'm good with, Taking care of our testimony. I believe you ought to take care of your testimony. I believe there's times that you ought to do right whether you feel like doing right or not. But as the, as the first and foremost, if we're more consumed with the outside appearance than we are the inside condition, then listen, we're going to fall. You see the severity, I believe, of his sin. Let me tell you the second thing. Back in Matthew chapter 27, I believe it's worth noting. Can I tell you this? Sorry is not enough. You can't fix it yourself. You can't fix it. Anybody ever done something wrong and you just make it worse? The more you talk, the worse you make it. Man, I have. Start trying to explain it. Start trying to explain your way out. You'd been better off just say, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. I'm a moron. But you just keep trying to talk and you try to keep we uh, reasoning and weaseling and trying to slip. You can't fix this yourself. Judas had a condition. There's no way that Judas could fix this himself. Can I tell you something? Sin's the same way in our life. There's no, you can't fix it yourself. It's not a problem that you can fix yourself. Listen, people try to fix it re with religion. People try to fix it with good works. But it is not a problem that you can fix by yourself. You can't just undo what's already been done. You know, it's kind of like words. You know, once they're out, you can't take them back. Man, I've said some things that before they ever got out of my lips, I wish I could take them back. I've said some things preaching before. And before it ever came out of my lips, I wish I could take it back. Maybe, maybe even hurt people. That wasn't my intention. But maybe even hurt people, maybe embarrass people. I don't, I, that's not what I want to do. I want to preach straight. I want to preach honest. But listen, I don't, I'm not looking to deliberately hurt people. But I, I can see, I can watch your demeanor. And sometimes say, mm, I probably should have said that a better way. But I've also said some things in my life that didn't just slip out or didn't get taken the wrong way. But I was pretty adamant about when I said it. I said some things, I'm not talking about filthy communication, I'm not talking about that. I've said some things in a pretty hateful way to some guys that, that, that work with me sometimes that I regret it after I say it. But you know, usually you just can't go back and sorry doesn't undo the hurt that it done. We were working, I guess a couple of years back, we were working out the coast and, and uh, there was an old meter, an old uh, meter center inside. I mean, you, you don't see them anymore. And uh, my boss had said, I want that meter center. That was part of the deal. Bring it back. I want to put it up in my office. It's old. It's in great shape. Bring it back. So I told them, guys, I said, okay, I want you to go up, kill the power. We're going to put a temporary, put a temporary up, kill the power, take that meter down. And I did not stress enough, do not destroy that. I, I was just telling them to take it down. I thought, take it down, set it to the side. They took the meter center down. Chunked it, busted the glass out of it, dented the front cover of it, and the only thing I can think of is I'm on, I'm in big trouble. I should have stood there, and before I could get it out of my mouth, I unloaded on him. I mean, I absolutely let him have it, and I didn't call him in a nice little room, brother Darrell, like I should have, and had a powwow. I mean, I let him, and as soon as it came out of my mouth, I thought, 
you're an idiot. That was not called for. But I couldn't take it back. Now, I did go back to him and apologize to him in front of everybody because that's how I humiliated him, in front of everybody. So I tried to eat crow in front of everybody. But man, I wish I could have got it back, but I couldn't undo it. The damage had been done. Now, he forgave me. We had a good relationship, and I praise the Lord for that. But it didn't take back what it did. I couldn't just undo it. Well, I look at Judas here, and Judas made an effort to fix it himself, but you just can't undo what's already been done. His regret led him to try to get the chief priests and elders to take back the money. Look what he says. Back in chapter number 27, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, talking about Jesus, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? He said, take it back. Undo it. I shouldn't have ever done that. They didn't care. They wanted him dead. He was a pawn for those who hated Jesus Christ. And he just tried, here, take the money back and it'll all go, it'll all be better. But Jesus has already been condemned to die. You just don't undo the consequences of your sin. You just don't go back and not do it. It's already been done. You know, turning over a new leaf just because you feel guilty or not fixed or undo the damage that's been done. I know people that, that they've lived their life, well, I'm going to do better. I'm, I'm going to do better. Now, it's, it's a new year. I'm going to make a resolution January 1st. I'm going to do better this year. You're not going to do what's already been done. That You're not going to make restitution that way. His attempt was a failure. All that he tried to do, he failed. He failed. Let me show you this. You know, in verse number 4, he tells us he acknowledged his guilt. I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. Listen, he was dead on the money. What, what was wrong with him? He said he knew he betrayed his Savior. He knew he betrayed, or the Savior, not his Savior. He knew that he did it. He said, I have, I have sinned and that I have betrayed his He had come to the conclusion. He knew exactly what he did. I'm convinced of this. There's a lot of people that's never been saved that know exactly that they're sinners and they know it. And they hate it. They hate the concept. They hate the, uh, the type of person in which they are. They hate oftentimes the damage in which they've done. But turning over a new leaf is not going to do it. He acknowledged it, but look at this. He sought restitution from the wrong party. If you're trying to get forgiveness for your sin and be re through religion, it's never going to happen. You're trying to get salvation through a, a relationship with a preacher somewhere, it's never going to happen. I don't care how many services you watch on TV. I don't care how much money you send them for their ministry. It makes no difference to me. You can send money to missionaries all over this world, and that will not make restitution. You can be baptized and your fingers wrinkle. It's not going to make restitution. You say, why is that? The word sin, you know what that word sin means? It means to violate God's law. To violate God's law. Listen, the religious crowd could not, even if they would have, and this crowd wouldn't, but they could not make restitution and forgive because Judas' actions violated not their law, but God's law. And when we violate the law of a righteous and a holy God, the only one that can offer forgiveness and make restitution is the God in whose law we violated. If I do Brother Darrell wrong, I mean just dirty, low down, do him wrong, and I walk over here to Brother Jason and I say, Brother, will you forgive me? That don't fix my, that don't fix my, I didn't sin against him, I sinned against him. I didn't betray Brother Jason, I betrayed Brother Darrell. And if I don't go to the one in whom I have violated his law and betrayed, there's no restitution that can be made. Listen, I'm glad we've got a great go-between by the name of Jesus Christ that God sent to make restitution between the two, but he and his Father are one. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. But I can't do it through religion. Man, the world over is trying to do it through religion. We need to stop being so consumed with religion and start being consumed with the relationship with Jesus Christ and what that entails. Now, I believe that does entail uh, part of a local church and faithfulness to the house of God and assembling with the believers. I, I, listen, I ain't jump ship on this thing, but just don't get the cart before the horse. All right, so he acknowledged his guilt, but he sought restitution with the wrong party. Then look at the heartlessness of the enemies of Christ. He said, what is that to us? See thou to that. You know what they told him? It's not our problem. It's your problem. Can you imagine the arrogance and the block wall that he hit, when he went and said, oh, I, listen, I feel bad about it. I shouldn't have done it. I regret it. <laughs> That's your problem, buddy. you got to live with your own choices. You knew the consequences. 
But the problem is, is he didn't go to the one that could have made restitution. He went to the wrong source. I believe today that there's people that seek seeking restitution with God, but they're looking in the wrong places. They're putting their confidence in themselves. I'm going to do better. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to stop doing I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to start uh, stop uh, be, using drugs. I'm going to stop running around on my spouse. I'm going to stop all of these things. I'm going to do better. That will never make restitution for the guilt of your sin. Oh, you might forget about it for a little while. You might feel better about yourself for a little while. But it's not going to make restitution. It's not going to make restitution. Where do you make restitution? You've got to make restitution through the one in whose law you violated. That's it. And until you understand the severity of your sin and you go to the right, to the right place to make that restitution, you will never be dealt with and forgiven. Ever. Judas. Man, the severity of his sin. He betrayed Christ. He couldn't fix it himself. I tell you something, you're not going to do good enough to get saved. You're not going to be good enough uh, to admit. You're not going to do that. You're not going to fix it yourself. His attempt was a failure. The heartless of the enemies of Christ. But listen, can I tell you this? Giving in to sin's ministry, uh, to sin's misery, that's not the answer either. Listen, if you're here today, you say, Preacher, I, I feel guilty. I feel a weight on my shoulders of sin. And I, I can't live like this. And, and I, you know, I'd just be better off not to be here. Well, that's not the answer. Listen to me, that's not the answer. That's what Judas did. That was Judas' solution. Look what he said in verse number 5. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. I'm just going to end it all. Listen, he may have gotten rid of for temporarily, but he didn't re- receive the restitution for his guilt. I thought about this. Do you realize that Judas opened his eyes in the same hell as the rich man did that Jesus told us about in Luke 16. He said, what's that tell me? That tells me he didn't, there wasn't any restitution that was made. There wasn't any forgiveness that was granted. Wasn't none of that. The same hell that the rich man opened his eyes in is the same place that Judas went immediately. You know what the Bible says about that place? The Bible says where the worm doth not. The fire is not. Listen, it's still on Judas' mind today. Think about it for just a minute. It's still on his mind. But aren't you glad for those of us who are saved by the grace of God? There's coming a day when he'll wipe away all tears. And I can go back to my sin and I can remember the shame of that. But I can also go back to the day that I went to the one in whom laws I betrayed. And I went before him and said, by the grace and by the help of God, if you'll save me, I want to be saved. I'm going to tell you something. My, de- my guilt was dealt with. There. I've quoted it. Man, I love this. There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The severity of your sin, you can't fix it for yourself, but God has a plan for your redemption. God's got a plan. God's got a plan. So, preacher, I failed God. I know that, and God knows that. Now, don't misinterpret what I'm getting ready to say. God, because of His loving mercy, is not just going to bat His eye and wink and let you into heaven, let you escape being a violator of God's love. You're not going to do that. But God's got a plan. But you don't have to go to the same hell that the rich man went to. You don't have to go to the same hell that, 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 uh, that Judas went to. You can go to the same heaven that Lazarus got to go to. Let me tell you God's plan. Judas attempted to buy back his relationship. What did he do? Brought the money back. Brought the money back. But you know the thing about sin? There's no exchanges and there's no returns. A lot of times we buy something, we have an impulse buy, and we take that back. When I was younger... I think I was 14. I come home with a t-shirt one time. I'll never, I won't forget this. And all my friends had them. It was a big thing in the 80s. And it was, a, it was a, I'll just tell you, it had beer advertisement on it. And uh, it, was, uh, it was something that was big. And I, I just thought, well, that'd be good. I'll just come, I'll just buy me one. I bought it with my own money. Well, I come home and I showed mom and dad. That wasn't a good idea. I'm fortunate that there was exchanges and returns because they made me go back to the store. I'd drive all the way back an hour to Charleston to take it back. For all those that you know, we didn't have malls in my hometown. We didn't just run. To, it took us an hour to get back. And she says, you're not wearing it. But I want it. Stomp my feet, pound. I want it. He said, I don't care what you want. You're taking it back. And I took it back. I'm, I'm grateful there was some exchanges. But there's no returns and exchanges for this thing of sin. He tried to buy his own redemption. He tried to buy it back. That's what the word redemption means is to buy back. So how in the world can it be dealt with? 1 Peter 1, verse number 18 and 19. 1 Peter uh, chapter number 1, verse 18 and 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed or bought back with corruptible things such as silver and gold. Judas, 
That silver is not going to get it. All the gold in the world, all the sacrifices that you can offer, all the good works that you can bring, all the good deeds that you can do, you wasn't redeemed with those things. What's he say? He said, from your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. How is a person redeemed? They're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and that alone. You ever think about, you ever think about Judas's betrayal sent Jesus to Calvary to pay the debt of Judas's betrayal. Man, that's an awesome thought. Even though Judas betrayed, his, uh, betrayed the Savior and it sent him to Calvary, Jesus went to Calvary to pay for the very sin that crucified him. Can I tell you something, Christian? He went to Calvary to pay not just for Judas' sin, but for my sin and for your sin. And if you think you're going to bypass God's plan of redemption, you're undervaluing the, the, the price that Jesus paid on Calvary. You're undervaluing. You're way, what you're saying is if I can work to get there, then Jesus died unnecessarily. If my salvation is based on my good works, my good deeds, my good thoughts, or my good actions, Jesus died without cause. If you say, well, I've got to accept Jesus and do good works, you're putting your good deeds on an equal playing field with Calvary. See, it's not that way at all. God's plan of redemption was Jesus, has been Jesus, and always will be Jesus. That's God's plan for redemption of man. See, He says, for all of sin, first of all, that includes me, that includes you. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so that death passes upon all men, for that all have sin. Romans 5 12. You, me, just like Judas, have violated God's law. And what's he tell us for that? For the wages of sin is death. For, for, is death. My sin, your sin, his sin. He paid the price of death. The Bible says that Jesus died for all. That means he died for you. Just like you're a sinner, his sacrifice was for you. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says this, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one, look at it, died for all, then we're all dead. You say, well, who did he die for? He only died for a certain few individuals. No, he died for all. You'll never convince me that Jesus only died for a few, or Jesus only died. No, no, he died for all. He died. I'm a whosoever willest, my friend. He died for all. For all have sinned, yet he died for all. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. He went to the cross to pay your sin debt. And the Bible says that Christ will save all that call on him. And that too includes you. Romans 10, 12 says, For there is no, no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich. Look at this. Unto all that call upon him. See that word, word all one more time? That's me, and that's you. He's rich in all that call upon Him. If you go to Romans chapter number 10, and let's just turn over there for a minute. I'm just about done. You know these verses, and sometimes the familiarity of verses, if we're not careful, we'll skim through them, and we'll lose the impact that they're, they're meant to have. Romans chapter number 10 this morning. Down in verse number 8, the Bible says this, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is, look at it, the word of faith which we preach. The word of faith. Because 8 through 13 deals with faith in Jesus Christ. Not works, not good deeds. Faith in Jesus. That's God's redemptive plan. That's God's plan for mankind sinners to deal with their sin. It's faith in Jesus Christ. He says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse number 13 gives us the result of faith. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call how? Through faith. Through faith. That we find in verse number 9. Through faith. Can I tell you something this morning? Sorry is not enough. Regret is not enough. Repentance comes. Repentance that leads to salvation comes. When I see myself as a sinner, but I also understand that Jesus Christ paid that sin debt. And I'm willing to do something about that sin and receive Jesus and put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Sorry is not enough. But listen, salvation is sure. 
You may, you may be sorry for you. That's not, that's not enough. But salvation comes through Jesus Christ and Him alone. Why don't you stand with me?